Hello students and welcome to this lecture on RNA silencing. In this lecture, we will discuss the mechanism of RNA silencing and its application to Senor Hebditis elegans, the C. elegans model, which has been utilized for the study of RNA silencing. In the first part of this lecture, I will introduce you to some fundamental concepts and we will then proceed to C. elegans as a model organism. The key concept of RNA silencing focuses on the interaction between two complementary RNA molecules. So these are some of the keywords which we will be learning today. We have sense RNA, antisense RNA. So these are essentially the positive single-stranded RNA and the negative single-stranded RNA. We will learn about the enzymes Drosha, Expotin, Dicer, Argonaut and the RISC. So please remember these keywords as I will reference them throughout the course of this particular lecture. So when we have interaction between two RNA molecules in the presence of these multiple enzymes, they form a complex and lead to the degradation of the RNA molecule and the subsequent loss of the translation of that particular messenger RNA. This is just a schematic representation of the entire process and we will go through it step by step during the course of this lecture. Now we have what is known as antisense RNA, which is the complementary strand for RNA. RNA is single-stranded, but when we have sense and antisense RNA, we refer to the RNA strand in terms of the messenger RNA and its complement, which is known as antisense RNA. We have the enzyme Drosha, Exportin-5, Dicer, Argonaut, and these all basically constitute the RNA-induced silencing complex. Now, the reason why we study microRNA and double-stranded RNA is because they are an important tool which can be applied to regulate gene expression in eukaryotic systems. The objectives of this lecture are to introduce you to the concept of RNA silencing, to describe the mechanism associated with RNA interference, to explain the methods used in RNA interference, and to facilitate the development of RNA-based experiments. For the purpose of this lecture, I will be referring to the C. elegans model, Senor Hebditis elegans, as it is a very convenient and graphic way to represent RNA interference experiments. So upon completion of this module, you should demonstrate the ability to describe the cellular components associated with RNAi. This basically refers to the, uh, the different elements of the RISC complex. You should be able to describe the process of RNA interference and apply RNA interference to target a specific gene transcript in eukaryotic systems. This is some of the terminology which will be referenced across this particular lecture. miRNA refers to microRNA which is localized in the nucleus. siRNA refers to short interfering RNA which is localized in the nucleus as well as the cytoplasm. Drosha is essentially a ribonuclease. So a ribonuclease will cleave RNA and its location is in the nucleus. Exportin is involved in the transport of the RNA molecules and its location is in the nuclear membrane. In addition to that, we have the dicer, which is an endoribonuclease. So the endoribonuclease references enzymes which work on the peripheral regions of the RNA molecule or at the two terminal ends, as well as the internal, internal part of the RNA. We also have the argonaut, which is a homing endonuclease. So a homing endonuclease technically can be programmed 
to bind to a specific region of the RNA by virtue of the RNA which it binds to. So the argonaut basically functions as a molecule which will uptake a small RNA molecule and then seek a complement on the larger RNA strand. And we also have the RISC. So dicer, argonaut and RISC are localized in the cytoplasm. The RNAi system was discovered and characterized by two Nobel laureates. So the first observation of RNA interference was by Napoli, Lemieux and George Jensen and they transform petunia plants with anti-calcone synthase RNA. Now calcone synthase is an enzyme which is responsible for color as well as fragrance. So in this particular experiment they transform petunia plants with an anti-calcone synthase RNA. So what they observed was a blockage in anthocyanin biosynthesis. So obviously the sense and antisense RNA molecules had interacted in some way and there was a change or modification in the color of the petunia flowers. So in their particular paper which I have reference you can refer to the smiley face at the top of this page and you can click on this link in the pdf notes and you can access this particular reference so they propose the mechanism of methylation to explain this particular interaction between the calcone synthase rna molecules they did not explore it further and they left it at that this was in the 1990s now an antisense rna is essentially generated by placing an RNA molecule in a reverse orientation with respect to the promoter sequence. So this gene construct can be introduced into plants or animals using biolistic or other approaches and the RNA is transcribed. So what essentially happens is that we have two RNA molecules. The first one which is in blue is the RNA which is the sense RNA which is the native RNA in the host and then we have a red RNA which is the anti-sense RNA and this antisense RNA are both transcribed based on this promoter sequence and these sense and antisense RNA sequences interact within this particular organism. So RNA silencing was discovered or basically they elucidated by Andrew Fire and Craig Mello and they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine and they basically expounded upon RNA interference and RNA silencing and the stoichiometric action of miRNAs. So stoichiometry basically refers to a dosage driven experiment in which case your experiment is driven by the dosage and as the dosage increases linearly there's a consequent linear decline in activity. Let us look into this. So they use the nematode C. elegans which has been made famous by the late Sidney Brenner, another Nobel laureate and this organism is unique because the siRNA molecules can be delivered via oral feeding. Now this makes it very easy to deliver the RNA molecules into the organism without a destructive method such as biolistics or other chemical transformation methods. So simple oral feeding with E. coli that have been transformed to carry the siRNA molecule will permit the uptake of these siRNA molecules in this particular organism. So the RNA silencing was achieved by basically creating a strain or a variant of the worm, the C. elegans worm by introducing a gene for the green fluorescent protein in for expression in specific tissues and the worms which are fed with the E. coli basically contained a anti-sense RNA molecule which targeted the GFP transcript. Now what was observed was very interesting. They observed the cancellation or the basically the degradation of the transcripts which were associated with the production of the GFP indicating there was some interaction between the sense and the antisense RNA molecules. 
So this work was only made possible because of the discovery of GFP, which can be utilized for live in vivo imaging. So Fire and Mellow genetically modified C. elegans to express GFP under the control of a constitutive promoter. Now this promoter is a promoter which expresses all the time. So they produced a synthetic version of double-stranded DNA using in vitro transcription and C. elegans was fed with double-stranded RNA containing a GFP specific sequence. So they observed that the GFP signal was attenuated or weakened in a dosage dependent manner. What this implies is that as they fed the C. elegans with more amounts of the particular dsRNA, the RNA signal or basically the GFP signal was attenuated or weakened. So they made a very interesting observation and this led to the discovery of the mechanism of RNA interference. Now we will be studying C. elegans as a model organism throughout the course of this particular lecture module and I will break this lecture module into two parts as there are many concepts which must be discussed prior to your understanding of the this particular topic. Now C. elegans is basically a worm, it is a soil dwelling nematode and what makes it very interesting in terms of molecular biology is its simplicity. The Nobel laureate Sidney Brenner, the late Sidney Brenner was the pioneer in C. elegans research and he basically studied it in terms of its development and neurobiology. And C. elegans has very interesting features which we will discuss during the course of this particular lecture. Now C. elegans is a soil dwelling nematode, it is about 1 millimeter in length so it is visible to the naked eye, the unaided eye and they are parasites and you can basically isolate C. elegans by placing some uh, vegetative matter in the soil with a soil uh, piece of soil in the lab and the C. elegans will basically grow on the vegetable matter. So generally in a laboratory setting you will use a piece of cabbage or a piece of leaf and you will place it with a soil sample in a moist bottle and you will have C. elegans growing or basically the C. elegans from the soil will then inhabit the leaves and you can pick up the C. elegans and then you can grow them on plates containing E. coli. So the C. elegans will basically feed on E. coli in the laboratory setting. Now C. elegans survives freezing and thawing, in fact they have been sent to space and they are, can be stored in large amount of genetic stocks. So you can store them in the freezers and at 20 degrees centigrade which is the room temperature in a temperate climate or in a tropical climate you have to set it up in an air conditioned laboratory. The C. elegans has a life cycle of 4 days and a lifespan of 2 to 3 weeks. So C. elegans basically moves across the surface by lying on its side. So it does not move like a snake, it moves on its side by moving the muscles. Now this particular mechanism of movement can be utilized to study neurological functions by mutation, mutating certain genes. And you will see how these genes and their modification or the de depletion of or the deletion of certain genes will lead to changes in the movement and the locomotion of this particular organism. Now with regard to the genome of C. elegans, C. elegans is a diploid with five pairs of autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes. So you have the male which are XO, unlike human which is male which is XY and then we have the hermaphrodites which are XX means that the males have 11 chromosomes and hermaphrodites have 12. So the size of the genome is 97 megabases which is about 8 times that of yeast and the first genome sequence or the draft genome was completed in 1998 and it is the second eukaryotic genome which was sequenced after yeast. The genome contains about 19,000 genes which are about 3 times more than yeast and 51 percent of the genes have homologs in the human genome. Now this makes it very interesting to be used as a model to study certain drugs and biochemical processes as 51 percent of the genes are similar who have homologs in the human genome. 
So there are two basic persuasions in C. elegans. So what we refer to as genders, we have males and we have hermaphrodites. So hermaphrodites produce both sperm and eggs later. So the sperms are produced first and eggs are produced later. In the absence of a male, the hermaphrodite is self-fertile. So this is an evolutionary mechanism which ensures the survival of the worm in conditions which are nutrient deficient or in conditions in which there is no male available to carry out fertilization. So this makes it easy to establish mutant lines and to generate homozygous recessive animals. So by self-crossing hermaphrodites, you can generate a homozygous recessive animal. So based on Mendelian inheritance, roughly one-fourth of the offspring of self-fertilized heterozygous hermaphrodite will be homozygous recessive. We will also almost be almost all hermaphrodites. So this is a very interesting characteristic that enables you to generate a homozygous recessive animal for crossing and subsequent experimentation. Now this is the general morphology of a C. elegans. So you have the tail, the gonad containing the sperm, and then we have the gonad containing oocytes and sperm, the embryos and the vulva. In the case of the tail, there is a specific mechanism which is composed of a sensory rays and fan. And this is the copulating mechanism in the case of C. elegans. Okay, this is a cross section of the worm. So you can see there's a nerve ring. So you can en envision this as some kind of a wire setup, like a cable an electrical cable passing through the whole body of the organism. And then we have the embryos, the oocytes, the gonads, the spermatochia, and the body wall muscle. So this is a very organized structure. And the digestive mechanism is basically a pharynx, an intestine, and the anus over here. So that's the basic structure of the C. elegans. Now, in a population, males occur at a lower frequency of 1 is to 600 and are generated by non-disjunction in meiosis during oogenesis. So, we have the XX and the OO eggs, and the O eggs have no X and create a male when fertilized by an X-bearing sperm. There are what are known as HIM mutations, which basically refer to the high incidence of male mutations. And the presence of males permits the defined process to be made for genetic analysis. So the ideal strategy to create a population is to isolate hermaphrodites first, maintain a homozygous population, and then you can mutate one of the males, insert a certain gene or delete a certain gene to study its function. And when there is a mating between a hermaphrodite and this male carrying the mutated gene or the engineered gene, you will have a subsequent observation of that trait in the progeny. So males are genetically de determined by having a single X chromosome. So they produce both X and O. So null for X sperm and thus the offspring from male by hermaphrodite cross will be 50% male and 50% hermaphrodite according to the laws of Mendelian inheritance. So the development of C. elegans occurs through four larval stages. We have the instar stage. I will describe this with a diagram in the next slide, which are separated by molds. So they effectively mold, which means they shed their outer layer of cells. So the life cycle is temperature sensitive. It takes about 72 hours or three days at 20 degrees centigrade, but only 50 hours as the temperature increases by five degrees. This is because of the increased metabolic rates. So after we reach the L4 stage or the fourth instar, worms live for two to three weeks and there are mutations which can be used to both shorten and lengthen this lifespan. And this has become the subject of studies involving longevity in humans. So the worm population can be basically lengthen in lifespan or the duration of its life can be increased by mutating certain genes. C. elegans is also very robust, it's able to survive in space shuttle Columbia explosion. In fact, these organisms, model organisms have been taken to outer space to 
to study the effect of microgravity as well as the radiation in outer space and its impact on human health and in the 2003 shuttle columbia explosion which was a tragic event in which the shuttle columbia exploded and all the astronauts lost their life a canister of these worms was basically fall to the earth it basically was expelled from the shuttle and fell to the earth during the explosion however they were found intact with live worms indicating their ability to survive even such catastrophic events so under adverse conditions in the wild the c elegans basically the l2 stage can enter into a dormant larval form known as a dower so as you can recall we have l1 l2 l3 and l4 so at the l2 stage if there's a nutrient limitation which is known as a adverse condition the firm will form what is known as a dower or a, basically a state which remains in suspended animation until the conditions improve. So this is the remarkable way in which this particular organism survives. So we basically began with the division of the cell, the first cell, and then you have the gastrulation, the formation of the comma, the, the first fold, the second fold, the third fold, and finally the worm itself. Then you have the dower stage and or the L2. In case there's a nutrient limitation, you'll have the dower stage. If not, it proceeds on to L2, L3, L4, and the young adult. So that's about one millimeter or 900 to 940 micrometer. And all these worms can be observed under a optical microscope using light microscopy. So the reason why C. elegans was studied initially was because of the nervous system and the limited number of cells, basically 302 cells, which are responsible for chemotaxis and mating. And the chemotaxis control network involves about 40 cells that control body muscle contractions. Chemotaxis basically pertains to the ability of an organism to move towards a specific chemical signal or chemical messenger and these chemical messengers may be in the form of the compounds released to attract mates as well as the food. Now by modification of the cells, these 40 cells, the basic signal cues or the attractants of a worm can be clearly elucidated and the synapses that are involved in signal transmission use chemical signals such as GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, acetylcholine and dopamine, which are all involved in human physiological functions. So there are mutants which are generated by deletion or insertion of genes and these mutants can be basically studied for the defect in movement as well as in behavior. And this data can be correlated with human cellular biochemistry and function. Interestingly, uh, C. elegans forms a very useful model for studying nicotine addiction as it is basically uh, becomes addicted to nicotine and upon withdrawal it exhibits the standard symptoms of withdrawal and they become sluggish and this is a very interesting model as it can be utilized to study the effect of drugs on the nervous system and it has led to many kinds of experiments involving different molecules which are signal molecules. So this is basically the uh, a diagram which is displays the formation of the neural network which is very simple and you can look at it and study it in detail. Okay, now we move on to gametogenesis or so basically the formation of the sperm and the eggs and the formation of the fertilization. Basically, C. elegans is, has a separate germline and a somatic line which is basically separated early during the developmental stage. So we have certain cells which differentiate into the gonads and certain cells which differentiate in the, the tissue involved in digestion and the neural response. So the gonadal system is basically a U-shaped tube in which nuclear mitosis is separated in time and space from cellularization. So basically 
we have a separate set of regions or there's a division in the worm's body in which you have certain processes which involve the development of the reproductive cells. So, all oogenesis or generation of the sperm and the ovum takes place in the syncticum as an apical stem cell and they undergo multiple rounds of mitosis to create nuclei which then progress to meiosis as they move through the gonad. So, the developing germ cells progress as nuclei through meiosis as they move down the syncticum gonad finally cellularizing as they reach the uterine compartment. So, fertilization is internal and the fertilized egg is released to the vulval opening which we have seen in the diagram. The first division of the embryo takes place in 30 minutes after deposition. So, the egg is basically deposited in the soil or in our laboratory system, they will be deposited on the petri plate and after about 30 minutes, you will have the division of the cells which you can observe using an optical microscope. Now, transgenic worms can be generated by microinjection of plasmid material directly into the synctial gonad. Now, so what this means is basically you uh, can inject a plasmid DNA containing a gene as well as a promoter from the worm directly in the synctial gonad, and there will be a basic expression, a transcription, and translation of that particular gene in the worm and this makes it very useful as the process of microinjection can be carried out in a laboratory setting using a conventional optical microscope and a microinjection facility. So now what is very interesting is the number of cells in the body. So the cells in the body are limited. So the hermaphrodites here elegans consist of 959 cells. And the male has slightly more cells as 1031. And this is basically due to muscle and nerves associated with the spade like trail. So these are the additional cells which the male possesses. Now, what's very interesting to note is the number of cells is constant in hermaphrodites. Okay. So the embryo basically undergoes rapid cell division, and you have different lineages. I will reference this in the next slide. And each cell's contribution is unique, and later ablation experiments show that removal of founder results in the complete loss of that cell's derivatives in the resulting animals. So, what this basically means is that when the cells start dividing, each cell has a certain fate. So, if you have a six cell stage, you can remove out one of these cells, and you will have a loss of development of the lineage related to the cell, which means that if you have six cells and you remove one and the remaining five cells, those five cells will not take over that particular function. So, you have lineages in the animal and removal of the lineages, lineage cells or the founder cells can result in changes in the morphology. Okay, so we have our lineage cells. So, we have the first cell and then you have the AB and the P1 and then the P1 EMS. So, if I were to remove the AB lineage, you will basically have no development of this particular neurons, hypodermis, pharyngeal muscle, body muscle and others. But this will basically be a fatal mutation as you will only have the P1 dividing cells. However, if you remove out this particular lineage at a later stage, if you remove out E, you will have an animal without a gut. However, this will also be a lethal mutation as there will be no gut and the animal will not be able to absorb nutrition and digest food. You also have the MS which is related to muscle and the neurons. Now, if you were to remove, for instance, P4 at this stage, you will have a removal or basically no development of germ cells and this will result in the loss of the fertility of that particular worm. So, by removal of specific founder cells, developmental biologists have studied the biology of this worm in detail. Okay, now, because of the founder map, we can basically do what are known as fate maps, so develop fate maps. So, by removing certain cells at certain stages, it can be developed into a different organism by changing the lineage. Okay. So, we have a mosaic worm. So, mosaics are basically uh, 
what is known as a stage in which your cell fate is determined by the location of the cell rather than the position. So now in the case of the CLA guns, we basically have 959 cells and the epidermis basically has 200 cells, the intestine 200, the nerve 302 and the muscles 60 and additional 130 cells are produced but die in control apoptotic deaths in the shaping of the organism. So the remaining 130 cells basically serve as a scaffold and they are basically have a dead end in the fate map. So the mosaic development is controlled by a lineage. So basically what this implies is that you can modify or remove certain cells via the process of ablation or removal and you will see different stages of development being altered as the animal progresses. So this is an, a lineage map. So because this worm has been so well researched and so well studied, the lineages are well known and well defined. So there are basically something which is very interesting in the C. elegans and these are the germ granules. So these are refer specifically to the germ line. So there are different elements in the P granule. So basically they consist of RNA binding proteins which are PGL1, PGL3 and the dead box proteins and GLH14. Mutants that fail to partition P granules into the P lineage are viable and fertile suggesting that pre granules are not essential to distinguish soma from germline in embryos. Okay, so the actual function of this is still under investigation. This is an indication of the localization of P granules using a dye, which is an antibody linked to a specific protein. So there are different uh, developmental modules and these are basically the different mutations. So MEX basically pertains to muscle access and you have the PLE1 which is the pharynx and intestine in excess. So this is an indication of the various mutations which have been developed by developmental biologists who are working with this particular organism. And the mutations enable us to study the worm in terms of its developmental biology and the biochemistry. Now, the process of development commences with gastrulation or the formula, formula, formation of the gastrula. So, in the gastrulation, E and EP are the end, endoderm percusses. So, they move into the embryonic mass to establish the gut tube and this movements are subtle in the small embryo but are no less important larger embryos that will meet in subsequent chapters in which larger movements will achieve the same purpose of creating the gut. So, this basically indicates that two cell lines will basically form the gastrula or the formation of the gut. Now we look at this particular development of the worm and we have basically focused on it because we want to understand the basis for RNA interference using the C. elegans as a model. So we basically look at the RNA. RNA is basically a single stranded molecule. However, because single stranded, it can self anneal or form complementary stand, strands, which is termed as secondary structure. Uh, now, double stranded RNA is degraded by the enzyme Drosha, which takes place in the nucleus. This degradation results in the formation of short, approximately 22 nucleotide fragments of RNA, which bind to the complementary target RNA and lead to the degradation of the target RNA via the RISC complex. So, RNA regulation is basically achieved by self-regulation using excess RNA molecules which form the hairpin structure. Please take note that you can utilize the program M4 which is available online to compute the RNA structures and the formation of hairpin at different temperatures. So, we have the components of the RNA interference pathway. So, Drosha is basically a ribonuclease as the name suggests. It targets double stranded RNA and it is a ribonuclease which means it cleaves RNA. It initiates the process of microRNAs 
It cleaves double-stranded RNA into characteristic strand of structures, which are 70 base pair in size, and it works in concert with the protein Pasha. This element or this particular drosha and Pasha are localized in the nuclear envelope. So this is how drosha will basically function. So when we have our RNA molecule, I have indicated the hairpin structure in red and the drosha basically cleaves the region which is complementary. So you have a palindromic sequence there which I have indicated and drosha will cleave that particular palindromic sequence. Now please take note that the complementarity of RNA is determined by other factors as it is a weak interaction. So you have to look at the temperature as well as the cellular components and the electrolytes present in the cell. So this is basically the answer to the question about what physical parameter determines the formation of secondary structure, which is primarily temperature. So this results in the creation of the pre-microRNA. Now the enzyme export in 5 is associated with the nuclear membrane. It facilitates the export of pre-miRNAs from the nucleus into the cytoplasm for processing and the RAN GTP cofactor is necessary in order to facilitate transport. Now what you should know is that the process of RNA regulation is basically a method by which the cell regulates the amount of energy it utilizes for sustenance and replication. So if you had all the RNAs being translated into protein, there will be an overload on the cell. So in order to cater to this increased demand, this entire cellular machinery will have to basically be utilized to produce more protein. So the, uh, the way in which the system functions is basically it utilizes the mechanism of RNA regulation to control the number of RNA molecules which in turn subsequently reduces the amount of RNA and reduces the energy component of the cell. So we have your pre-microRNA which is cleaved by drosha within the nucleus and is exported out of the cell via exporting. Now DICER processes the pre-miRNA by cleaving off the hairpin region. So this results in a short double-stranded RNA. So we have the pre-miRNA and we have DICER. So DICER basically cleaves off the top of this hairpin and we'll have the pre, the short DSRNA which is 21 to 22 base pair in length. Now the RNA strand pairing occurs because of the palindromic sequences. Okay, so one of the strands of the double strand RNA molecules is now discarded because if you have two strands, there will be no room for it to bind with complementary messenger RNA. So one of the strands is basically degraded. And then we have DICER, which is a post-transcriptional gene trans silencing enzyme. It's an endoribonuclease, which is type 3. It cleaves double strand RNA into small interfering RNA. And it cleaves naturally occurring long double strand RNA into short hairpin pre-microRNAs into fragments of 21 to 23 nucleotides with 3' prime overhang of 2 nucleotides. This is very important. So, siRNAs and miRNAs serve as guide to direct RNA-induced silencing complex to complementary RNAs to degrade them or prevent their translation. So what essentially happens is that the messenger RNAs need to be degraded in order to prevent them being translated into protein and utilizing a great deal of energy. So gene silencing mediated by siRNAs is also called RNA is also called RNA interference and it controls the elimination of transcripts from mobile and repetitive DNA elements of the genome but also the degradation of exogenous RNA of viral origin. And this mechanism is basically utilized by this, the host cellular machinery to identify RNA which is non-self. This may be related to RNA which is from a virus and it will basically degrade the RNA which is from an exogenous source. We also have argonaut, which are proteins which bind specifically to siRNAs and miRNAs. They are guided by the siRNAs or miRNAs to their specific target RNA transcripts 
expressed ubiquitously, which is throughout the system, and we have two families, AGO and PIWI. They are highly conserved, and PV is associated with germline cells and is involved in the silencing of mild genetic elements, or what are known as the transposons. So this is a schematic representation of argonaut. So the argonaut siRNA or G AGO miRNA complex will bind to the target RNA transcript, resulting in the degradation of the transcript O, inhibition of translation, or decapping and deregulation. So all of these three mechanisms basically render the messenger RNA not fit for translation into protein. So these are the three mechanisms which I mentioned earlier. First is the degradation of the target mRNA strand. Secondly, the blocking of translation, uh, maybe blocking of the RNA ribosome machinery. And finally, you have the decapping of the mRNA strand, which is the decapping and the removal of the protective mechanism, which in turn results in the degradation of the strand. Argonaut can then directly degrade target mRNA within the RISC. This is the result of its activity as an endoribonuclease. So Argonaut basically blocks translation. It can block, block the translation along the length of the RNA and basically it can bind to the ribosome binding site or downstream of the ribosome binding site. So this is how it functions. So this is the ribosome. And the ribosome is basically, we have argonaut. So argonaut will degrade the strand somewhere in the middle. So we have the 5 prime to 3 prime N, and somewhere down the middle, we have a degradation and there will be no translation. So argonaut can also deadenylate messenger RNA, which is the poly A tail. So it can target the poly A tail and commence the process of deadenylation. And this in turn will cause the degradation of the mRNA as there is no end. There can also be a decapping of the 5' prime terminus resulting in transcript degradation. So we have the mode of action at the 5' prime and 3' prime termini. So we have um, both the 5' prime and the 3' prime termini which can be basically degraded by the argonaut. So RNA is degraded either in duplexes, which can be derived from DS RNA viruses and the genes which transcribe into antisense RNA as well as microRNA. Now RNA interference basically is a mechanism to prevent the overexpression of certain genes by basically regulating the transcript as well as uh, the removal of the double-stranded RNA viruses. So DS RNA viruses can also be basically eliminated by this particular mechanism. So where do these particular RNA elements generally come from? Earlier it was assumed that the introns are basically non-coding elements, but today we know that there is something known as the mertrons which are located between exons and these introns are basically encoding the RNA elements which regulate the RNA itself. So this is basically a form of self-regulation of the messenger RNA. So mertrons can be generated by engineering DNA to transcribe the RNA with a palindromics stem loop motif. So you can basically design a mertron by engineering a small section of a particular gene to include a palindromic motif and express this in host cells and then map the regulation of th that particular RNA molecule. So we also have short interfering RNA which can be generated in vitro by transcription using a plasmid and RNA polymerase. So these can be basically generated in a test tube or in a simple microfluidic tube simply by using a plasmid and uh, RNA polymerase. And this short inter interfering RNA can be injected directly into cells and it does not need to enter into the nucleus in order to be processed because the sRNA duplex is processed by the enzyme DICER, which is localized in the cytoplasm and processes the template for incorporation into the RISC.
So the, the siRNAs are routinely designed for genetic engineering experiments and they basically target the template using a, a known sequence and we have a seed region and a target template region. So the seed region comprises the first eight bases which have to match perfectly to the template. So we have the nucleotide 9A O G. So the ninth nucleotide should be either an A or a G. And finally we have 13 to 16 nucleotides which have a good base pairing. So this is basically the manner in which you can create these RNA molecules in vitro and then inject them directly into the cell. So how can we basically utilize RNA molecules for genetic engineering? So we can use double-stranded RNA as an elicitor for immune response and we can utilize double-stranded RNA as a regulator of gene expression. So immune response is the first application. So double-stranded RNA can be applied to elicit innate immune response. It mediates the interferon induction in response to dsRNA viruses. And this double-stranded RNA basically interacts with the toll-like receptor 3, TLR3, which is basically a receptor that recognizes double-stranded RNA and in turn elicits the respective immune response. So the second application, we move on to experimental design. So let's uh, design an experiment to validate the hypothesis of RNA silencing by following the footsteps of Fire and Mello. So basically what we have to do in this experiment is identify the target gene, design the synthetic RNA to target this gene, transfect the synthetic RNA molecule into the host, induce RNA expression by via the promoter and validate RNA expression. Let us see how this is done in a step-by-step -step manner. So the first step involves identification of the target gene. So the gene silencing experiments commences the identification of the target gene responsible for the trait which needs to be silenced. Ideally, this trait should be translated into the respective phenotype. The trait can be polygenic. However, if it is, all the genes which regulate that specific trait need to be well characterized. Now, in the case of the CA elegans, as I have mentioned earlier, you can basically target cells which are in that particular lineage, the founder cells, and we can look at the expression of that particular phenotype in the progeny or in the developmental stage of the worm. The next step involves the design of the synthetic RNA. So this has been discussed in the previous slide. I have shown you how you have to design the RNA molecule with the target gene, the 8 nucleotide exact match, the addition of the AOG at the ninth position, and then the addition of the palindromic sequence. Now, the gene construct has to also contain a specific promoter, which may be constitutive or inducible. So, in the case of an inducible promoter, you will have to introduce the particular compound which induces that particular gene to be expressed. The third step involves transfection of the host with the template RNA. Now, how do we generate the template RNA? Basically, you can do it in the lab. You can use the in vitro transcription using an RNA polymerase and you can do transcription in E. coli using double strand RNA generating plasmids such as P. litmus or you can use synthetic peptide nucleic acids. These are three ways in which you can basically generate RNA in the lab. Upon transcription of the template RNA, it is fed to C. elegans. So basically, the, after you feed the worm with this particular RNA molecule, it has to be induced to express. So expression can be induced by applying specific environmental cues. In the case of C. elegans, it's the promoter which is inducible when the host is exposed to a specific cue. So this basically pertains to cases in which you feed the C. elegans with a particular plasmid containing the genetic element and then you express the RNA in the host itself. However, if you do carry out the feeding based on RNA which is generated by in vitro transcription, then this stage is not required. So we end at step 3. And we do finally the validation. So in validation, what we need to do is assess whether the interaction is stoichiometric. Stoichiometry basically means whether the expression is dosage dependent. 
Now, in the case of RNA interference, you can feed the worms with different doses of messenger RNA or the silencing RNA molecule, and you can look for the subsequent or the consequent reduction in the expression levels or the signal level if it is the GFP protein. So, although the major components of the siRNA have been characterized, many questions still remain and these are still the subject of experimentation which you may undertake during the course of your career as a researcher in the area of molecular biology. So that brings us to the end of this module. To summarize, I have basically gone through the differences between RNA interference and RNA silencing. I have shown you the different elements of the RNA interference and RNA silencing pathway. We have discussed the components of the siRNA system. We have looked at the biogenesis of siRNAs or how they are created and transported out from the nucleus and into the cytosol where they carry out their respective function. And we have looked at the design and application of the siRNAs. And for all of these, we have basically utilized the worm or the C. elegans model as it is ideal and can be maintained in the laboratory as well as it has the ideal characteristics for a model organism. With that, I would like to end this lecture. Thank you very much for participating in this particular lecture. If you have any questions, please post them in the comment section of YouTube or you can also log on to the Smart2 or Smart3 system, which is our learning management system, and basically post your questions in the forum section. Thank you very much, and I wish you a happy learning experience. Stay safe.